Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Stick Time with Matt and Dave. I'm Matt Nowakowski. And I'm Dave Connor. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, this is going to be, I think, our third episode, right? Third it is, episode. dude. We're getting there. So yeah, we're, we're, building the, we're building the base. But thanks for tuning in, guys. We really appreciate all the support and the conversation, uh, even from our last episode. Um, we love to hear from you. And uh, tonight we're going to be covering kind of real deal FPV racing, as we're going to call it. So not just uh, hanging out in the backyard, maybe flying with your buddy but uh organized races yep multi-gp chapters local chapters uh regional chapters and i mean even the going on from that but we're going to start in with what you need to get race ready so even your skill level your gear what class you're going to be racing kind of going into finding a local league so how do you go about finding a local league what to expect when you actually go to attend your first race um and then uh in the vein of stick time i think we're going to get in and we're both going to talk about our own experiences because we were beginners once and i love sharing our experience because it's it's I i feel like that's what's connecting a lot with our listeners is Oh man, I really, I really, I didn't know that about you. It's mm-hmm. really nice. To, it's cool to see that you came from that. So, um, we'll cover that up in the end, and that I think that's going to package up a nice uh, little episode tonight for FPV racing and getting into it. So, uh, let's start right off the bat, and I'll ask you this question: What do you think uh, the minimum skill level is needed to have? Do I need? Do you, doesn't does a beginner need to know how to fly acro or is a horizon mode okay like uh what where what what do you need to actually get into fpv racing i would say a couple of key things you're gonna want to prepare yourself for a race is uh you're gonna want to be able to fly lower to the ground gates are only five by five and you're probably gonna want to have practice a gate or a flag or something before going to a race. At least that's the way I did it. That way, when you're there, that's not gonna be your main focus. Is like you're you're not gonna be worried. Can I hit this gate or not? You know you can hit this gate. Um, now with the auto level versus or auto horizon versus uh, acro. Um, people go at it both ways. I was real quick. I wanted to get out of auto level horizon mode as fast as possible. So I would do it just to be comfortable while I was practicing, and then I immediately learned how to do acro. But that's not always the case for everybody in that situation. There's a lot of guys that go to races, and they'll actually race in some kind of horizon mode because that's what they're comfortable with. It's safe. you know. They're, they're not going to freak out or flip out, out of the sky for no reason because they don't know how to fly acro. Um but it, it doesn't really matter which one. As long as you're out there, you're racing with your dudes, you're having a good time, uh, you, it's going to be a good time for you. And the only skill level, like I said, you probably practice a gate or a flag before that. Yeah, because the only thing I would really have to add to that is safety. Is A lot of these organized races, especially for our local chapters, the safety of the pilots and spectators is utmost importance because nothing ruins a fun saturday or sunday hanging out with your buddies flying quads like somebody having to go to the er yeah and i mean it does it it really doesn't hurt just that person it hurts the entire vibe of the entire day and that's why you're out there you want to have fun and i mean i don't i don't blame the guys who have just picked up a quad and they they don't know how to fly acro mode they just want to get that adrenaline that mm-hmm. that excitement that comes from fpv racing so i don't i would never knock on anybody at the skill level just go try it really yeah, is exactly. my advice be sure that you could safely fly your quad you're not going to get out of control you know you could disarm and you know that you're comfortable at least like flying your quad around other people and you know that you're going to be able to not hit them yeah i'm glad you brought up the safety aspect that's something i should have definitely hit on too um luckily in my instances going to events and stuff there hasn't been an emt needed or anything like that it's usually just a like a flesh wound they would say from what a movie was that (laughs) monty python yeah dude (laughs) it's just a flesh wound um so yeah it's usually just like a nick on the finger some cases is a deeper cut on the finger but most of the pilots out there, they don't want to go to the hospital. They just want to glue it up, tape it up, you know, maybe finish get, race day, finish racing and get it stitched up later. So the community and the pilots have been pretty good at safety. So that's definitely key. You want to learn how to control your air, aircraft anyway in Horizon or Acro for safety. Absolutely. Yeah. So and I mean, that safety varies here because uh 
there are a couple of different classes I think you could enter, and uh, the damage that the classes of quads could do vary dramatically. Um, I mean, I know there's whoop class, so a lot of those races actually are in bars, restaurants, kind of public spaces. I've seen them in malls. Um, science centers. Science centers. Uh, classrooms, even gyms. Yep. Like people will have these offices uh, that they've had these uh, whoop races. They're small, ducted propellers. They weigh 40 grams all up. Yeah. Max. I, max, like max, max, maybe 40, 60 grams, something like that. They're light enough to have fun and go smack your dude in the face with it. Yeah. So, I mean, they're pretty safe. The imitation cutting. level is low on that. Yeah, yeah. you're not cutting anybody. Um, so, de- definitely, like, I know in some of our local uh, whoop races, we don't even have spotters. No. It's an honor system for your laps if we don't have a timing system set up. Um But we don't even have spotters. And that's something we'll get into a little bit later uh, when we start talking about attending races. Um, But there's micro class after whoop class, so a little bit smaller. Um, Usually those gates are more LED oriented. Um, I don't think they do have like Multi-GP has a spec size for micro class gates. Yeah, battery Um, size too. Yeah, battery size. Two cells instead of one cell. Prop size, I know too. Um, They limit it. So in this, all of these classes, uh, quote unquote, that we're going under are all Multi-GP sets these out. And Multi-GP is one of the largest... uh, if not the only really kind of grassroots drone racing organization. And they have chapters all over the entire world. Odds are there's one literally in your city. Yeah, right next to you that you didn't even know about. You just got to go there, sign up, multigp.com, sign up, profile pilot, and uh, then they set your home turf right there. They tell you what the closest is. Hey, to these you. are these are the chapters in your backyard. Correct. And then you can go in there and search by city or search by state, which I do, search by state. That way I can see which one's the closest to I can drive to if I don't want to just keep racing at my same local field. Absolutely, yeah. Um, after the micro, though, there is the the standard open class, which is what we've been we we kind of talk about as the the mini quads, the five inch, six inch racers. Yeah, I in a lot of our last episodes, I would say full size, full size. Yeah, which I mean, it's probably not the correct term for it because a bunch of drones are different sizes, and some are bigger than others. And full, full size is almost like you're talking about full size aircraft. It, it's just the 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 norm, which is a five inch, uh, you know, two hundred millimeter frame, one eighty millimeter frame, three hundred to six hundred grams. Correct. Yeah. So that's what I I say with full size, and that would be your standard, your your open class. Because if you're saying full size. There's even X class and Beast class now, yeah. which are larger. Correct, like 13 inch props or something like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> be- they both run 13 inch props, and Beast class is just like that in between between uh, normal standard open class and X class. They just went up a little bit more on the frame, and they run all the same components as X class, but it's not quite up to X class standards, which is like 800 to a thousand millimeter frame. Yeah, and those ones are the big ones. Uh, primarily made to try to branch into more of a spectator sport yep because they're not just little yeah 220 millimeter carbon fiber toothpicks just whizzing around at 80 <laughs> miles per hour that you can't yeah. see you just hear it yeah so they on the x class there's canopies and leds and things to make these kind of like uh the drone championships league their 2019 racer um, that spec racer that has the canopy on it that attaches just like uh, the body frames on RC cars with just the cotter pins. Yep. So, but those, and and they also kind of look good on the crashes too. Yeah, when they it, do. When it has something to fly off. Yeah, um, I know oh, the DRL racer, I, I don't know if this purposely how they built it, but that plastic on that frame is like super delicate. Like if you look at it wrong, it breaks. So... <laughs> It, when they crash those, you just see parts fly everywhere. So I'm pretty sure the engineers that created it, like, it it was cool for aesthetics. Like, it wanted to make it look sleek, but it was very cool when it explodes into well, a wall at I mean, 80 if, miles an hour. If you, 
You know, you like, talk about you talk about NASCAR. A lot of people are like, "Yeah, I love NASCAR. I watch it for the crashes." So, like that same thing. Same and I thing. Think, I think DRL's first season, all of their promos were actually like a, a race or two, just slamming into like four or five fluorescent tube light bulbs, mm-hmm. just like crush crashing into glass, breaking things, um, hitting signs in slow motion, and that's kind of what they they. They used as like that that crash appeal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's kind of what X Class is too. They want more spectator, bigger, um, brighter crafts, which are kind of what DRL's doing. They're bigger crafts. They're not X Class size, but they are bigger crafts that for spectators. So, six inch, right? Yeah, six inch, correct. So that's the reason why your Racer Three just sits on your desk. Yeah, I you know. want to keep that plastic pristine, <laughs> dude. And I, I, t- I keep telling people I'll let them fly it. And like when it comes to shove, like somebody comes and shoves me a little bit and is like, "Hey, I want to fly this." I'm like, "Man, all right. Do you know how to fly? Yes. <laughs> all right. Will you stay in the open field? Yes. All right. Will you not do flippy floppies and lose control? Yes. The only reason is because my my plastic, my polycarbonate or whatever it's called, is in mint condition." <laughs> I don't want any scratches, any cracks on that guy. And I mean, if you if you look into, I mean, I know Gab posts a lot. Jaws was doing it, getting ready for the season. Wild Willie, and really, kind of almost all of those DRL pilots. Mm-hmm. They, if you see one of their like practice racer threes, they're all duct taped up. Like, oh yeah, the the even before they start flying it, they duct tape it up well, to try to protect it. No, it's not to try. I talked to Jaws. I think it was about this. And it's not, or it might have been Nurk. Um, it's not to protect it. They actually cut the ends of the plastic off and then tape it on because it's easier when you want to work on the inside and repair something. They don't have to like take all these screws off, the propellers off, and everything to pull the top shell off. So if they cut it right before the motor, they can take the top shell off without taking their propellers and stuff to repair it. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. So that makes a lot of sense then, because yeah, there are the screws. I think on the top and bottom. Yeah. Uh, for every single like that two shell piece of canopy. Yeah. I'm surprised that they don't sell um, that. Because I feel like that would be such a hot seller if they just mm. sold the frame where it was like, hey, yeah, we have too many of them, like an overstock. Like, yep. here's the frame, here's the polycarbonate, it's a hundred bucks. It would get snatched yeah, up. Yeah, dude. Don't offer a warranty, don't offer anything. It's, do you want to own a Racer 3? People will buy it. And build it your own. Like, we're not giving you our proprietary motors. No, we're not releasing anything like that. But yeah. but that makes it, that's why it's not grassroots racing, dude. So, the, you know what I mean? Coming back full circle to our, our episode today, that, you know, that's definitely more pro style racing. Correct. So, you've been racing for how many years? And I mean, I would say that you're on par with those pilots flying, or, you know, you're there with them. Uh, but you're, you, you're stunned a lot of you in that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I say that you're not even in that yet. No, yeah. Because you're going to yeah. get there. I believe in you, man. Yeah, exactly. But uh, they are definitely a couple of stages above me. They mm-hmm. they put in more time, dedication, stuff like that. And uh, I'm more of a chill, relaxed flyer. I definitely want to get on DRL one day. Shout out to DRL if you're listening. You know, Matt Nowakowski, check. A little self-plug. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I definitely want to get pick on me up side Winder. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, See, talk I, to my agent, Dave Connor, you know, right <laughs> over here. Uh, I don't have to ask because I'm just going to win the tryouts next year. Oh, dude. And so that's going to put me in it. So uh, sorry, gotcha. orange stuff. I know you're doing really good on the simulator, man, but I'm going to come and snake that out from you. Now that Fluxy's out of the way. Yeah, dude. But they don't, they don't even have to worry about like what's cool about those races is they don't have to worry about any of their gear at all so like they just show up and they have all their gear ready by somebody else but when you're going to a local race you need to have some gear man right i mean you do i mean well you're obviously going to need a quad well that's number one you got to get in the air somehow it's got to be (laughs) got to be some kind of quad drone whatever absolutely um so i would say i would recommend it you i mean you need at least one i always say recommend two it's just really nice if something goes wrong, instead of trying to pull out parts to fix it in between your heats, you just have another quad to pick up, plug a battery in. Yeah. Um, usually out before a race, um, and we'll kind of get into to more of the requirements a little bit later in the episode, but sometimes you crash. And sometimes things break. Most of the time you crash. And I would much rather be involved in the race, uh, either spotting or at the scoring table or goggles in, watching the race uh, in FPV feed to try to find a better line 
than being closed off in my own little world, soldering iron in hand, uh, trying to fix something. It kind of throws, it, 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 it doesn't ruin the fun of the day, but um, I mean, I definitely have my experience of fixing stuff in the field. Like I, I make the joke that I, I usually end up working on my quad more on race day than I actually do on my bench, and I'm a tinkerer. Yeah, I love, dude. I love working on quads and building quads all the time, but I always find myself having to fix stuff. So, um, I started building up this fleet where I don't, ne- I could, I could fix it later if I need it later. I could repair it, but I have another quad that I could reach for. So I would say two quads. Um, you need to have a good radio, and yep. um, I would say decent fpv goggles I yeah they don't have to be the top dollar goggles out there you can seriously go to uh hobby king any of these places out there and get your diy box goggles our buddy ian actually that's on the cqs team he uh he started out with the quantum box goggles and he was you know freestyle and he was racing with it he made it work for w- what he had you know but uh, eventually you'll realize that you're gonna want to step up to either smaller form factor or a better product uh so that's why most people like uh run fat sharks you know the warranties there they're they're small form fitting and they can fit in your book bag yeah and uh i started with i just bought the e-sheen box goggles for like 50 bucks when i started yep um they had a channel scan but they didn't have like a dedicated you could flip to a channel so you couldn't scroll through channels or bands so that was a big deal breaker when i started racing i had to upgrade two goggles that actually would lock specifically on a channel because if you need one it's great to like if you're just flying by yourself you hit the channel scan it finds your channel immediately cool sweet not a problem but when six other quads are plugged in and you accidentally (laughs) bump the button you're not finding your quad and if you're finding it you're not finding it on the exact channel so as soon as you get 15 feet away from you boom your video is going out video is the most important gear to have when showing up to a race because not only does the the video transmitter on your quad interfere with everybody else's experience if it's bad, but your experience could be ruined by just your goggles being not picking up the best signal. Yep, I, I can uh, I can see what you're saying there because I remember Rob used to have those exact same goggles where it's like the 007s or whatever they were called. Yep, and they had only auto scan, and I remember he would be out at the line, and if he showed up to the line while people were plugged in, he would have to ask them to unplug. So you can plug his quad in to scan for the channel to get locked onto his channel, and then everybody else can plug in. So it's a little bit of a nuisance for everybody else that's there and having the event run smoothly to have people to unplug and wait for you to find your channel on your goggles. So if you just get goggles that can go to a specific channel, you're good. And the same with the VTX. You're going to want something you're familiar with that doesn't really bleed onto other channels because there is a lot of generic VTXs out there um, that will actually, even though you says it says that you're on Fat Shark 1 or Race 1, that it will bleed over onto other channels and people will get black lines and stuff on their yeah. video. And I mean... Don't don't get us wrong and don't be intimidated by like the, what we're saying. If it sounds scary or anything, it's not. No, um, it's not going to ruin everybody else's time. And usually, if you have any questions about your gear, you could contact the race director, um, which we'll kind of get into right here into our next section. But and even if the race director can't help you, or I mean, they're going to be able to help you. Somebody else who's on the line with you is going to be more than happy to offer help. Especially they're going to recognize that you're not a new face uh, or you're a new face at the race. And, and I mean my first race and I know I go out of my way for newcomers to our local races to make their experience the best. Because if you show up to something and like, we're always trying to get more people to come out and race with us. It makes the pots bigger. It makes it more fun, especially like the group of people that we have racing with us now. It's, we're, we're almost becoming like a family. We go out and see each other all the time, and yeah, we're we always are. competing with each other. So, I mean, it's it's awesome. It is, so, it is very awesome. Don't be afraid. No, don't be afraid. I, I wasn't saying that at all to be afraid. I was just saying it 
to keep that in mind in the back of your head. But if that's all the gear you have, we're going to make that work. You're going to come and race with us. We want more people racing. And because uh, we want to grow our local club, which you can find all your kinds of local clubs all around you. I'm multi GP. That's like the place to go to find your local flying yeah. dudes. So that's how I found um, all of the local leagues. Um, usually a quick Google search. If you just search, uh, you know, we're here based locally in the Cleveland uh, area in Ohio. I just Google searched Cleveland FPV. Boom. Immediately the first thing that comes up, Cleveland Quad Squad FPV drone racing. So yep. like, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to know. And then I found the website. I found the Facebook group. Found the multi-GP page. Goes Go into that. Start looking at all this stuff. That's how I found QRGO, which is the Quad Racing Group of Ohio, which is uh, Paul Adkins' chapter over here. Yep. Which I would say Paul runs a... Such an efficient uh, <laughs> That's the perfect league. way to describe it, dude. Such an efficient league that's fun for everybody, and he goes out of his way to make sure everybody has a good time, even spectators. He'll he'll pull them in and get them involved, um, and he's he's such a nice guy, but that's uh he's so he's such a nice guy and so good at his at his uh race directing that a lot of other chapters and like when they host regional races they'll ask paul to yeah, be a part bring of him it out, man. yeah because he keeps everybody on schedule but yeah multigp.com facebook groups uh are getting really really big if you just search on facebook cleveland fpv a lot you'll see a lot of things pop up uh yep. there's the roto riot uh, Facebook group, which does cover a little, it bleeds into racing there, but mostly it's the multi GP drone racing Facebook group where almost every single chapter, at least in the United States is posting, uh, Hey, this is our race. If there's a live stream going on of a live streamed race, that's local somewhere they post it on there. Um, and then following your local chapters, as you'll find them is usually where you'll get the up-to-date information on when the races are, when this registration is open, because at least with our league, the registration usually doesn't open until uh, a week before the race, unless it's a large that's, race. That's most most of the chapters out there. They'll give you like a week to sign up for the race. And uh, if you do, I, if you don't have Facebook, I highly recommend it. If you're looking into getting this hobby, uh, you want to start a Facebook because like uh, Dave was saying that. Most every group out there or organization out there is going to have some kind of Facebook page where you can go there, see the latest up-to-date information, because sometimes even uh, you won't see anything on multigp.com. You can go to their Facebook page and they're, oh, we're thinking about throwing this race, but it hasn't made it to their website yet. No, and so it hasn't posted. Exactly. You, you get all the up-to-date information on Facebook, and that's how most of us communicate with, through Messenger and all that good stuff to find out what's going on, where, where's this at, and uh, how do I get there? How much is it? All that, all that good stuff. And I'm glad, I'm glad you said that as well because even I know for nationals this past year, uh, when all other communication failed, like the email that people put in their multi GP uh, pilot like uh, account profile. Um, if that email was like an old spam email, which I recommend using your real email, there's no spam emails that go out. Mm -mm. Um, and you just get emails when the chapters you follow post races. So yep. you could see them immediately go, oh, yeah, I I'm going to make it this one. Or some kind of update that MultiGP is putting out like, hey, Nationals, we were thinking about having it in December. We're going to have it on February yeah, or, or something like that. Hey, check out the new World Qualifier track. Correct. It's released. Look at the diagram It's good here. information. It's definitely not spam information. No. But look, back to what you were saying, it, it, they use Facebook as, uh, I'm pretty sure this is what you were going to say, was their last resort is like, if I can't find you an email, I call your phone, you don't answer. I'm messaging you on Facebook. Yeah. Like that's usually the universal way of reaching anybody uh, through all of this is on Facebook Messenger. Yeah. So if you don't have a Facebook and you want to get into drone racing, just start a Facebook just for drone racing. You don't have to install it on your phone. And if you're worried about privacy issues or whatnot, um, you're being spied on anyway. You don't probably, even have to put so. pictures or anything <laughs> up there. You know, you just put your name up there and you, maybe your FPV handle for uh, for your nickname on Facebook. Yeah. And then that's, you know, you don't have to be active on your Facebook. You just can browse you can be a ninja yeah. in the woods just looking at all these facebook groups just to stay informed exactly but i think there's also a good aspect of those facebook groups if you do run into any issues that is when the community is 100 percent behind you correct and 
you'll say, hey, I'm having this problem. This ESC is doing this tone, and I've never seen this before. If you post the question to one of those Facebook groups, within a matter of seconds, you have people commenting on it looking for ways to help you out. It's so, awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, it, dude. Unbelievable. I think that's something that you're going to hear as a reoccurring theme through, uh, especially almost anybody talking about FPV, is the community is... 100% just genuine and better than any I've played music for the better part of my life uh, better than any music community I've seen um, it's just everybody is so it's a community and not competition Correct. everybody's here for collaboration and making each other better even when they're at the line and competing at races where there is money and trophies on, and glory on the line Somebody will be like, oh, man, your quad's not working. Here, fly one of mine. I can't. I, th this win won't feel right if I knew you weren't flying. Yeah, dude, and that's <laughs> – you, you hit the nail on the head there, man. Every, every place I've gone to, it doesn't matter if it's in Texas or uh, California or Michigan. Every place is the same, which is awesome, you know. The, and I, I like driving to all these places to, like – see if what our local guys are doing is the same as everywhere else and it pretty much is you can go there even if you don't have tools or anything these guys are going to help you uh, you're going to get some that you can borrow and fix your quad and uh but yeah i'll drive man i'll go the distance i will drive to michigan and fly and i suggest that to everybody they should go and travel to their other local chapters well maybe not so local couple hour drives i wouldn't go more than i mean well i'm a bad example i drove cross country for reno <laughs> so <laughs> but normal people usually only drive an hour or so i think probably to another race for a race i know for our local races uh we have actually so qrgo is is the the big league we'll call it here um we have our cleveland quad squad but a lot of those are practices smaller or specialty like one off races. And, and we're more of a race team that likes to travel together and have a good time exactly so but qrgo and paul adkins will actually do seasons mm -hmm. so that keeps people engaged with year-round racing there'll be a winter season of indoor micros and an outdoor season of the open class racers um, yeah. so you full scale full full scale <laughs> yeah. full scale quads um but yeah the five six inch um kind of outdoor racing five by five multi gp gates the whole setup but that even that my first race that i attended there um we're in cleveland here and a little bit south uh probably about an hour maybe hour 15 minutes away yeah is where the track is so that's worth it for me it's a ten dollar drive you know you get the glory of competing with your friends and hanging out that's fine. Yeah. I mean, I know people will travel. You said you drove cross country for Reno, but the stakes are much higher. So you kind of have to weigh it for, you know. Yourself personally. Yeah. You got to weigh it for yourself. Is it really worth, this is where like that saying risk versus reward comes in. Yeah. Is it really worth the, I wouldn't say it's a risk to drive that far, but is the investment of driving that far really going to be something I, is there's going to be something I get out of it? Um, I don't always go to races and stuff expecting to get stuff or win stuff. I go for the experience of meeting people, socializing, networking. Um, having fun. Having fun. So, like, my my scale on how much I'm willing to pay to or drive or drive is uh, pretty high. Like, I, I'll go, like I said, across cross country with my dudes just to get that experience and I feel like the drive and the risk that I'm putting in the drive definitely is lower than the or the rewards higher than that risk so I'll do it you know automatically I, I would drive but most people are going to have like an hour maybe two hours is the most they're going to want to and the way that you kind of have to think about it too is a lot of race days I would say depending on the format of the race uh, you could be there anywhere between six to eight hours. Yeah, it's an so all-day thing usually. If you tack two hours onto each end of that as a drive, you're driving two hours, you're racing for eight hours, you're driving home for two more hours, you're gone literally for 12 hours. D so dude, I'm definitely on the extreme end, dude, because when you're saying that you're talking about driving during the day, or I mean during the morning, racing all day, going home at night, I remember me, Scott, and Rob, we actually went to an event, uh, 
it was early on in our racing uh, hobby that we went to Infet in North Carolina. We stayed there overnight. We raced. Then we were driving back that night. Then we drove all night to Cincinnati because the next day they were having a race in Cincinnati. So we didn't even sleep. We just drove. After a race, we drove from North Carolina. We drove all the way to Cincinnati. We stayed up all night. We raced all day in Cincinnati. And then we drove back home that day. So, like, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm on the extreme end of, like, <laughs> that, dude. Because I, I, as I'm explaining it to you guys, like, that makes me sound a little crazy, dude. <laughs> like, just a tiny crazy. But that's what you'll do for FPV, man. Yeah. That's the excitement of yes. the racing. Yes. And kind of, I mean, I, we should have probably covered it uh, right off the bat. But the why of why do you want to get into racing? But it's, it's the excitement, the adrenaline, the... It's it's flying freestyle is a lot of fun. It's and nice, yeah. It's it's soothing for personal. Yeah, I think even like whipping around in the backyard through gates could be soothing for, through pers- per for personal reasons. Yeah, but nothing quite. It, it's it's an experience, and I mean, like I said, I play music, like playing, uh, like in front of an audience and live shows. That's kind of like the same kind of feeling. Gets your adrenaline. You're, you get excited. Like there's a certain like. Uh, at, I can't really explain it, but it, it's it's the way it makes you feel. It's almost it's like magic, a drug. Dude. It's, it's like, like magic. It's like Disney. It's but magic. when you get on the line and it's goggles down, thumbs up for good video, and you're ready to get racing, and you hear those quads power up and start screaming off the line, and you know you're in that heat with them. Yes. It's you see, see you're <laughs> like you're getting excited yeah, here dude. anyway. You know it's happening, and like you know you have to be on your game, but you're having like it's. It's an incredible experience, and then once you do it, you want to just keep doing it. You're like, oh, man, I know I, 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 know I could cut that shorter. I know I could get in front of them there. Oh, man, I should have made that pass on the second lap. Like, all this stuff, you just get so into it, and you feel like a fighter pilot race car driver. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I agree 100%. But even before you get to that excitement of that first race, like, there's a couple of things you got to do at your first race that people should probably know about, right? And I wish there was... I know I know it showed up on the internet sometime, but I wish there was some kind of, like, checklist guide, especially before I went to my first race, of, like, what should you bring? And I think it's out there now. I don't know if UAV Futures did one or maybe Oscar Liang. I mean, I know there's a lot of, like freestyle guides out there like a lot of the freestyle pilots out there they'll like this is oh, what, what i put in my bag what do i have in my bag what do i take out to the field before i go fly but racing like i don't know if i've even seen one you know and it's a little a little bit different than freestyle i would say because uh there's a lot more uh repair tools i think you need to take and <laughs> multiple quads that most freestyle guys maybe won't do and on top of that even some restrictions for the gear that you may already have on your quad oh yeah i didn't even think about that because yeah. the number one i think like I, I mentioned earlier video is is really kind of the number one here your vtx usually when you sign up for a race on multi gp there will be specs saying 25 milliwatt transmitters maximum which most races nowadays are 25 milliwatts just to give everybody the best experience you're not blowing out anybody's video when they get farther or you know they're farther away and your quads right in front of them you're not blowing out their video or anything so that's really you want to make sure you have a compliant uh video transmitter and also that you have one that covers all of the range of channels that multi gp uses correct i would say 99 percent of VTXs out there are a okay as long as they are rated, they're okay on the channels and bands. Some of them may not go down to 25 milliwatt. I know a lot of the ones now, but if you have older gear, maybe two three years ago, well yeah, like 600 600 milliwatt was the norm. I was gonna say the Immersion RC VTX only had 600 milliwatt and it only did fat chart channels. Now, not saying that's bad. Uh, there is in multi GP you can select like oh my VTX only does these channels, um, and they'll they'll help you get on a channel that your VTX runs, but the milliwatt is kind of like a hard set in stone. You can't go over twenty five milliwatt or you're not going to be able to race. So I would highly suggest a switchable VTX where you can switch from twenty five to two hundred, and if you freestyle to eight hundred or or 
most of them out there will do three to four different milliwatt yeah. settings. It's switchable is almost became the norm. If you're building a quad now, almost anything you'll come across is a switchable power. And even with a pit mode, yeah. which that's kind of a whole different thing that's coming out and very new. But a pit mode is actually being able to power on your quad without it sending a video channel. Because if you're at a race and there's a heat going on, but you need to make sure that the motor's spinning in the right direction because you just replaced it, you can't just plug in your quad because your video is going to blow somebody out. Yeah. So there's some etiquette that has to kind of like come along with it, and that's why pit mode was invented, so you could work on your quad. Yeah, and not pit mode's been around for, uh, just uh, to go back a little bit, pit mode has been around for a little bit, but it it hasn't been to up to standards as it as it is now like it, before people were still complaining that it would like bleed over or whatever but now it seems like i think one of the, the only vtx's there might be majority of them are probably picking them up now but the major one out there back in the day and now is TBS Unify. And you just push that button in when you plug in your quad and it's in pit mode. Yeah, it just doesn't power it on. You unpower, you unplug, and plug right back in, and your video is back up and running. Yep. So you power it on, you're holding the button on the video transmitter, boom, you're in pit mode when that power's on and it's not going to be sending a signal. You could make all the repairs to your quad powered up, fire it up, Make the motors spin. Try and make sure that your turtle mode's working, whatnot, without disturbing anybody who's actually in a live heat. Yep. So v VTX power is definitely uh, probably number one of my number one things on the checklist. Make sure my quad runs 25 milliwatt. The next is if I'm doing a certain class, I want to make sure that the class restrictions are met on my on my rig. So if I'm doing open class, there's a wide variety of specs you can choose from, but you can't go over six inch prop like I said earlier, and you can't go over uh, a 300 mil millimeter frame. So everything else is basically fair game. Yeah. Six cell, three cell, four cell. And right where you see that milliwatt restriction in like the description of the race, you'll also see probably the class specs. Yep. Because it does vary from local chapter to local chapter. I know locally our race director, uh, Paul, he kind of takes input from what uh, everybody's flying. So like he doesn't want to make everybody have to go out and buy new gear like – Oh, you guys are still raced on that? Yeah, we'll, we'll usher that into the class. And really now the multi-GB classes uh, have, I want to say, like matured to yeah. like be a very uh, accessible class where it's not just like, oh, only three people make that kind of gear that fits that. It's mm -hmm. almost everybody makes, makes gear for especially the multi-GB open class. Yeah. The only real deciding factor is going to be your battery size. Correct. So everything from 3S, I believe, all up to 6S. Yeah, uh, I don't think, uh, I'm pretty sure 6S is the limit. Like, I haven't really done research on this, but I think the last time I did read into it, it did have a battery limit of 6S only. I don't think you can throw a giant brick 12S on there and go race open class. They're going to be like, nope, nope. later. Yeah. You know, you want to go build yourself X class with that 12 cell, you know, go ahead, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, for the most part, it's, like I said, a wide range of specs for certain classes. So... That was just for open class. If you go to micro, the, there might be a motor spec, and you can't go over like 1106. I know Paul did that uh, a couple years ago. He had a spec on open class or outside class, and then he had a spec on micro class, indoor class. So it just depends what your local chapter is doing. That, that's not nationally at all. Like every event's different. No, but you want to make sure you comply. It's going to help have everybody have a good time. And then there's no surprises on race day because nothing's worse than like, showing up being like i'm excited to race and they're like yeah you, well your quad doesn't fit the class specs and your vtx is overpowered and looks like you're not racing today buddy it's not actually going to be that way because somebody would probably be like well here man i got a spare quad you could fly like let's get you in let's get you racing like let's have let's get you having fun um but for you to like just be the most prepared and i feel like that being prepared puts a lot of people at ease so like being being able to get comfortable and be like okay cool like i'm not i'm i'm out of my comfort zone because i'm at my first race but i'm not uh out of my element yep it, like i feel like i felt like i feel like i'm prepared yeah you know it, I, like, I like being prepared that's the know? boy scouts motto like yep. be right i don't know no i i, I was I, never a boy scout i was a, a cub scout just a little side note cub scout right here 
I think I got my first pocket knife from Cub Scouts. Were you, my, my mom was so what, mad. Scouts honor. Be prepared. It, no, we didn't do that. I think we did s- some salute thing. I I don't know. It was so long ago, dude. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that on, on class uh, uh, restrictions. Just make sure you know what it is. Be prepared. Um, power for charging at these events. This is something we really don't have to go into detail. You either have it or you don't. Yep. When they put the event out, like you get the email notification. It's going to say, hey, power's available. If you don't see anything that says power available, just assume they don't have power. Bring something to charge your batteries. Whether those. it's a larger battery, a car battery. I, I've used a... I bought one of those batteries, like uh, like the emergency car starters. Jump starter. Yeah. Yep. I'd use one of those. It, it's worked all day for me at um, pretty much an entire season um, that it charged probably like 12 4S packs a day. Wow. Back that's to back, back to back, back to back. No, and especially yeah, I, I think I picked up at Costco for like 60 bucks or something. Like where that worked. So, but there's there's that charge off your car. One of your buddies might bring a generator or something like there's that. There's battery boxes and stuff that people make that like are portable charging solutions that you just need to charge up and all in one. There's a multitude of ways to do it. Um, I would just recommend researching to find which one's going to be mm-hmm. the best for you. And if you can't afford any of that or you have no way to charge, just bring enough batteries. And that made a bunch something we should have covered in like the required gear is. At least our local races, I would say you don't really need more than two batteries if you have a reliable way to charge. Because yeah. then you could just, you have a battery ready to go. You could have a battery in your pocket in case something's wrong with the battery that you have. But then just alternate them. Um, I know we kind of have a tendency to thrash batteries a lot. Oh, um, especially hardcore, when for you're, sure. When you're crashing or pushing your quad to like go over the finish line, you're already, you know, the timer buzzed at two minutes and you're still flying and you're at, you know, three minutes by the time you're coming around to finish your last lap, like you're really kind of pushing the the edge of what your battery's capable of. So like you don't wanna you max it out too far, it's not charging back up. No. So you wanna have a backup. But I would recommend bringing a battery for every heat you know you're gonna run that day. But if that's not ideal, you could get by with two. Just as soon as you get down, you land, pop it right back on the charger. And then usually by the time your next heat is, that battery is either almost fully charged or fully charged. Yep. And if it's not fully charged, by the time that you go and spot, go to your, you know, go fly your heat and come back, you'll have a battery charged that you could then pop that one off, pop the one you just flew back on and just keep them rotating. And then I know we have a few dudes who actually compete when they compete professionally. They stick to one or two batteries because they trust them. You start to find discrepancies in your batteries, hey, especially. It's just all paranoia, dude. <laughs> I think when you're racing at a high caliber, though, it's really nice to know, like you have that consistent feel every time. So Agreed. you know how this battery is going to react, and you know, like, oh yeah, the one my one battery might, and I. This is why people mark batteries too. They'll put dates or they'll like put numbers on them so they remember. Because when you buy six batteries, all of the same make and model, like. It's hard to know, but one of them has that, you know, that sag after 15 seconds mm-hmm. just starts sagging out on you. That's not one. That's a practice that's pack. That's a practice pack for yeah. sure. But you don't want to like, you don't want that one sagging out on you on the championship final heat. You know? No, sorry, Bob. No, I don't. <laughs> no, you don't want that happening. So it's always good. That's why a lot of uh, some of our dudes, I wouldn't say a lot, but a few of them, uh, just trust they know hey these two batteries are running awesome today and then they just have that consistent feel so uh you're gonna register no yeah after i got all my gear and stuff i gotta get to the (laughs) event what's the first thing we do we pretty much i think the first thing is we check in we register register online usually that's when you get your channel so i'll set all my uh my vtx gear um all my channels i'll set them on my goggles set them on my quads Usually the night before the race is when things get locked down. Occasionally there'll be changes on race days, but the race director will be more than accommodating if that happens. It'll, yeah, and they'll let you know in registration or check-in. Um, hey, your it, channel changed. Yep, just to let you know I changed channels this morning. But then right after that, we usually do some kind of thing like a tech spec or a AMA check. Both of those usually go hand-in-hand. Hand. Like, hey, let me see your AMA card. All right, you have insurance. All right, take your props off, arm it. Let's check your fail safe, all that, all in the tech spec, all in one. Safety, 
very important. So you don't want to fly away and you want to be able to, the, the race director wants to know that if you lose control link, your quad's not flying out of control into the pits and possibly hitting somebody. So your radio link shuts down or if your arm button breaks or something while you're flying, you could just turn your radio off and your quad's going to drop out of the air, not damaging property, people, pets. Yeah, most uh, most of the quads you set up will usually set that up for you. Um, you want to double check, though, before you go to one of these events on your bench at home if that's working properly. Because I know some guys, when they update to newer firmware or they're running a different rig, sometimes the fail safe won't be set they get to the the tech spec and they're like why is this not working so if you can do all those checks before you get to the event it's just going to help everything run smoother and yeah i think you mentioned it but the easiest way to do it is you power everything on props off. props off you power everything on if you want to test and make sure that your quad's working at home take your props off power everything on arm your quad so your motors are spinning and literally just turn your radio off turn your transmitter off what you hold and then if your quad stops the motors you're golden yep you're good and it's usually it takes like some quads or one second right away it'll shut off but i think it's up to there's like a lenience it's up to like five seconds or something and you could set that but usually i think it defaults to about a second that it will try to still receive any information and if it does not then it goes okay i'm falling out of the air yep which is the drop setting, not the land, because the land will gradually re- reduce power. If in beta flight there is drop, yeah, you, you drop. want you definitely want drop. Like yeah. you want it out of the sky. You don't want it going to the moon, or slowly as it's drifting away, it's slowly letting the throttle down into a tree. Yeah, and know? I mean you run into issues too, where if like you break a prop and you have a three blade prop and you're only flying with two blades on one of the props. Sometimes, even if you lower the throttle all the way, the quadcopter is trying to autocorrect itself, so it's actually climbing. Yeah, I've so, had that happen yeah, plenty of times. And it'll happen in a race, just clipping a gate. So you want to be careful about that. It's all about safety. Um, that's the same with AMA. You already, already mentioned AMA. Um, there's kind of some other stuff that's that I bring to races. That's not like quad-related. Not quad-related, but um, if you're going to be out in the sun all day, bring some sunscreen because nothing's worse than getting burnt to a crisp. And then you start feeling sick by the end of the day. And that's usually when, like, the most important heats are or in the end of the day, whether it's, like, you're racing for points, uh, lap counts, or if it is a main elimination bracket. Yep. So those are usually the the better laps. So you want to be there. So, um, I mean, sunscreen, I usually bring some snacks, too. I love your snacks, those Doritos, dude, the Cool Ranch. <laughs> If you guys out there, if you ever had Dorito <laughs> Cool Ranch, you know what I'm talking about right here is if you get a perfectly dusted one with seasoning, that's like mint prime. It just looks beautiful in the light and you put it in your mouth. It's the best feeling ever. Dave seems to know where to get the best bags of Cool Ranch Doritos. I have my connections. You he can does. DM me. I'm not going to personally uh, uh, out my connections for well-dusted Doritos. <laughs> oh, they but you perfect. Could, you, could, you could private message me and I will be more than happy to share um <laughs> Some my, of your Doritos, my, dude? Not my Doritos. No, my tips and tricks on how you could acquire your own oh, Doritos. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm horrible. <laughs> Luckily, my dude brings snacks because I'm horrible at that. I don't bring snacks, but I do bring water. You do bring water. I, I bring That's lots of one. water. You know, it, it goes hand in hand with the sunscreen thing. You're yes. out there all day. You're getting dehydrated. You're sweating. You want to definitely get some kind of drink in you. Water, Gatorade. Powerade. Absolutely. Something that will refresh you. Exactly. Um, I know a lot of people too bring, uh, if you have like a 10 by 10, I know a lot of people just have them sitting in their garage or their basement, a 10 by 10 pop up tent mm-hmm. or any kind of like sun uh, coverage. Uh, people bring them because sometimes there is shade by like trees in the pits area. Sometimes there are coverings there, but a lot of times it's in an open field somewhere. And so you just get stuck out there. So kind of the same with uh, bringing tables. It's a lot easier to solder and have to repair your quad on a table than having to do it on, you know, the grass or the ground, your knee. Um, And you bring your quad gear. Don't forget your quad bag, you know. Well, that's, yeah, definitely a necessity. You need your transmitter. I have, uh, and I mean, you could go, like we mentioned earlier in the show, there are tons of pilots out there, racers and freestyle pilots too, that actually like, have reviews on drone bags where it's like look at all the stuff i could fit in my bag with all of my gear where it's like 
I could just take one backpack and it's all of my quad gear. So then I could have my table in one hand, my chair in the other hand, um, and well, I make one trip to the car, one trip to the field. That's it. That's that's my goal is like I want one trip to the car because it's like even when you pick up groceries, you try to grab all the bags once so you don't have to make multiple trips. I don't try. Oh, I do. You do. <laughs> it's the same it's the same exact thing with quad stuff. Like I just want to grab everything in one scoop and with a good book bag, I can carry all my other extra stuff that we're talking about with one trip. I mean, and there's tons of there's tons of bag manufacturers out there specifically for drones. If you're flying DJI Phantoms or if you're flying mini quads, they usually all have these uh, kind of like Velcro dividers on the inside that you can move and change around into different configurations to store any gear. So it's not even you know it's not a proprietary case for this fix fits the Spectrum DX9. And then, like, the foam's cut for it. No. You can move these dividers around and size them for whatever transmitter you have, whatever size goggles you have, whatever size quads you have. Or they'll have little straps already made on the outside. So that you can strap your quad to it. With just a battery strap yeah. that, you ha- that you have a whole bunch of. If you, you know, going to races, too. Like, even sometimes there will be a kind of registration prize. Like, oh, hey, here's a sticker or a battery pack or props for just signing up. Mm-hmm. Some of the races have raffles too, where by five bucks you get a raffle ticket, or just registering gets you a raffle ticket, which is awesome. Which, Paul does that a lot. Yeah, you could, and it, and it makes it fun even for people who aren't going to be winning the championship prize like me. Um, I'm, this season's the game changer, though. Yeah, yeah, dude, you're gonna get your podiums, <laughs> dude. Your first I've, places. I've yeah, I've gotten I've gotten the podiums. I've been up there, but I'm gonna get the first place here coming up. Yeah, um, dude. So I mean. That's pretty much everything you need to expect when you first get to a race and the things that you want to take to a race. But when you're at a race, are we setting goals for ourselves? I know I usually set a goal. Like if I go out there and have a practice lap or whatever, like I kind of can feel it. And I'm like, I could probably get one more lap onto that. Or, you know, I know I could. Yeah, I want to get I want to get around three laps in the time limit. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if that's how you are, too. But I know some people just go out there and wing it. They're just like, I'm going to fly and whatever happens, happens. But in the back of my head, I'll I'll do that certain little thing of setting some kind of absolute goal. Well, and I mean, I. I usually set I set a realistic goal so like I'm gonna have a fun day mm-hmm. regardless because if you're like man I'm gonna I'm gonna win today and then you are out of contention of winning because K Mead's been driving six laps on every heat and you're barely pulling five yep. and you're like man okay I'm not gonna win it gets in your head and I feel like it's a great way to ruin your day so like when I when I attended my first multi GP race with a timing system with an organized race i signed up i registered i set all my channels my goal for my first race was i wanted one complete lap around the track if i did that and i left i the the day of my first race i would be happy and guess what i did on like my second or third heat i made a complete lap without crashing and i was stoked It, it didn't matter what i did for the rest of the day i went there and did what i accomplished and what i wanted to do and prove to myself that i could do and I did it, and it, it was abs. It was wonderful. It was fun, and it, it bit me, and I wanted to come back and and do it again. You know. Well, that's kind of same with me when I went to my first race. I was like, dude, I just want to be able to fly with these guys and actually hit gates. Yeah. Like I just want to go through gates, and then the next race, I was like, all right, now I know how to hit gates. I've completed my heats and stuff. Now I just want to make you know I placed. I don't even know what it was, eighth place or whatever. Yeah. Now I want to try to get to seventh place. Yeah. You know, you just work your way up, and that's just like what we've said in multiple race or multiple episodes before. You want to race yourself. Yeah. You want to set these personal goals to beat yourself, and you don't want to be trying to beat the next guy. It's nice to beat him, but like you want to set these little personal achievements for yourself just like in video games you do certain thing you get a little achievement yeah and if you go out there and you complete one lap achievement unlocked you go out there to complete one heat achievement unlocked yeah. you came second place and your last heat achievement unlocked and yeah. you just keep working your way up man. yeah you win i want to go and i want to win one of my heats today yep like i want to finish i want to cross the finish line first like as small of a victory as it is it works and just how i set my you know my goal i wanted to finish one lap that's all I wanted. By the end of the day, I was finishing like entire heats without crashing. And so like that was like I 
I had met my goal early on in the day and then smashed it. And I mean, I did the same thing. I practiced in and out of gates. But kind of as you broke up, you brought you brought up my podium finishes. Uh, let's kind of talk about some accomplishments of what we had. And I mean, your your career is a little bit more storied than mine in terms of organized drone racing. Yeah. But I mean, I've gotten I've gotten podiums, and I think my best was a second place finish. I think I finished third place uh, in the season points this past winter season in uh, the Whoop Racing class that we had. So like. That was big for me, and that's kind of, you know, depending on your league, you might have season uh, races where you accrue points in every race of the, the season, or you might just have the championship race, you know, which we have both now. Um, yeah, which is awesome. I like both. You have the league mm-hmm. going on, and so the points winner, like, I mean, finishing third in that is huge. That was, uh, you know, an entire four-month, five-month season of showing up every other week to drone race and consistently flying uh on par and i mean i i maybe podium i didn't even podium but just being there all the time consistently running and having fun uh got me on the podium so Sick, like, dude. That, that that's i mean and, and that's a lot of fun so like what are your accomplishments because that's the best i've done and i know you've <laughs> well done... you you made it hold on you forgot one dude you made it to your regional final bro i did and that so was a large accomplishment i was gonna say too. that's a huge accomplishment is because you gotta do the qualifier and then you have to be good enough in your qualifier to get to the final. And so. I was, only, I think, only 20 people away at the end of the day when they went down the list of selections. I was only like 20 people away from actually being selected to fly at Nationals. So your next goal this year is? Fly at Nationals. Fly at Nationals. Exactly. So <laughs> I, I step it up. But, the, yeah, that was a big thing. And even when I, when I went to Chicago to compete, I looked at it the same way. There was no goals. Hey, it's cool if I'm qualify. It's cool if I'm not because I am just stoked that I'm here. That was a huge accomplishment in and of itself to make it past, and especially in the North Central region in 2018, I mean, it was stacked. Oh, yeah. We had the most brutal. Some other regions, everybody who ran the qualifier made it. Yeah, I I was going to say Paul would have made it to finals if he wasn't in this region. Exactly. And in this region, he was like 170th or 190th or however far down it was. So, like, yeah. And I mean, that was that was a huge so accomplishment. So huge accomplishment for you, dude. Yeah. So let's get to you because you've got even some bigger ones. Yeah, I got a couple under my belt, dude. Uh, well, let's see, like, my first memorable one. I think it was the first year at QRGO. And uh, there was actually two of them. The first uh, achievement that I set a personal goal for myself after I completed my laps and all that is I wanted to beat Andy, Drew Racer. He was like, he was the dude at QRGO that was the fastest at the time. And I believe like a couple races in, I ended up podium first place over Andy. So that was my first, sorry Andy, but you were my first accomplishment that I, I wanted to achieve. And he's probably not even being like, you, no need for an apology. That's awesome that, well, exactly. that that drive pushed you to be a better pilot. Yes, yeah. So that was my first one. Um, my second one was, if you guys are in the hobby, you'll know who Jeff Orta is. He's Vortex. He works for Rotor right now. Um, one of the original Detroit guys. Mm-hmm. And before I even got into racing, I saw that guy fly at a, a event ReadyMade was putting on FPV Fest. And he used to race way more than he did freestyle nowadays, you know. And uh, that was one of my goals is I want to beat Jeff Orta at a race. So, like... That's another accomplishment. Like, these aren't podiums or I'm not winning prizes. These are just personal accomplishments that I wanted to achieve. I think the following year, the year after, maybe two years in, I ended up beating him. I I didn't podium or anything, but I I finished, like, one place in front of him on on the (laughs) roster. So I was like, yes, I beat Jeff Horta. Gotcha. So, But then going into actual, like, uh, achievements where I did win prizes or anything like that, um, I got to... I did the Buffalo Bando race, was that last year, Yeah, I think. Um, I ended up taking the sportsman class, which I, I just missed out on the pro level class. There was two classes at, in qualifying, so they put me in the sportsman class. But I ended up winning that, got a nice little medal. That was very stiff competition there, though. That yeah. was a lot, a lot, a Even lot of Even in the sportsman races. class, the, the, the top you know 10 to 20 guys were tough. I mean, I, they were flying right along with me, so I definitely had to battle my way at the end. Absolutely. Um, and then, uh, just a couple other ones that definitely sit in my head is just making it to nationals two years in a row, Yeah, which was sick. I couldn't believe I would be able to do that. 
going to Hawaii in 2016 was cool. I mean, I didn't get like, uh, I got hand selected to be on a team, but I didn't have to like work my way or win my way into it. They like hand selected me. So it's not like I set a goal. I'm going to go to worlds. You know, it was just like, no, Hey, you want to go to worlds? And I was like, okay. Yeah. But that's putting in that performance locally that got you noticed. Well, yeah, locally going around to all the local events and, uh, make myself known networking. That's why I tell people set up a Facebook, like start following people, start talking start giving advice, be a part of the community. And the community is going to be a, a I don't want to say a part of you. Cause that sounds weird, <laughs> but the community will embrace you. If oh, you yeah. are a part of the community, the community will be behind you. You. Definitely. But uh, to like finish this episode out, let's do, I'm going to start it. Let's do two personal goals or accompl- accomplishments that you want to achieve this year or a following year. It doesn't have to be this year. It just maybe the next couple of years you want to achieve something. Yeah. So the first thing I want to achieve is to make it to the final 32 or whatever in nationals. Never been there. I think it's final 32 or final 16, yeah. whatever it may be. The that final bracket. Final bracket racing. I've never done that. That's like my next goal. I almost made it this year. I ended up doing the the sportsman class or whatever. Mm-hmm. I made it into that bracket. But I want to make it into pro bracketing or bracketing. And uh, my second goal, which has been a goal since I ever started racing drones, is to make it onto DRO. Like, that's just like, a, I guess it's everybody's that race's goal is to be on the DRL. And uh, that's definitely one that I told myself within five years, I'm going to push to try to get on DRL. That's the dream. But I mean, coming in that top, top 32, top 16 in nationals, uh, like they did this year, winning pilot on nationals of nationals got a DRL contract. So, yeah, I mean, so they, you they just go, gotta go and win it. They go hand in hand a little bit. So those are my two goals that I, I set for myself coming up in the future. Well, what are two goals that you would want to set? And then we'll close this episode out. So uh, definitely I want to take, I want to win a race. So uh, usually. So podium, like first place. Podium, like, first place, any race. Yeah. So usually I, I set the goal that I want to be in the top seven. Yeah. Depending on the talent that's there. Sometimes, like for our local races, I know I could be in the top seven almost every time if I I race good. Yeah. And there's plenty of times I get bumped out because we have some very fierce competition. And a lot of the guys who, you know, maybe just started last year or the year before are getting real good. Yeah. So even the guys that we've been flying with for a while have put in so much work lately to get real. We're all pushing each other. And that's that's a beautiful part of the community. But I want to win a race. So I want to best everybody. So that's goal achievement one that you want to unlock. And I think my we already kind of covered it. I want to qualify for nationals. And you say this year or maybe next year, which I really, I'm going to really try this year, but seeing the times that people are already posting on dude, that gold would, qualifier track. Dude, Evan Turner is like a 10 6. I know. My best that I've done in the simulator, I think, is uh, like, uh, I think it's like at 18 or 19 seconds. And I mean, like, that is breakneck speed for me. I couldn't imagine shaving 10 more seconds off. Yeah. You, I mean, I think you could hold- do it though, Dave. I, think I, I'm I have holding faith. The- I have faith, dude. I have faith. On the DRL sim right now, out of I think like 180 people have ran the course. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sitting at number 13 or 14 right now. Okay. So, and I think that's like it was right like a minute, uh, a minute and three seconds or something for three laps. For three laps. Okay. Yeah. So like right around that. Um, I mean, like yeah, that's not that's people not pushing it, and it seems like everybody's flying it a little bit slower in the sim. Than what real life times are actually showing up. No, those think, are definitely uh, those are definitely two great goals. I think personal and great goals that should be set for yourself. Yes, yeah. those two are uh, unbelievable. I, I think kn- you're going to accomplish it. I, I mean, I'm going to have four chances at least here locally mm-hmm. um, because both of our chapters here are tier two, so we'll be able to have two uh, qualifiers, and I'm sure they're probably going to end up being like double headers. But we'll have two double headers this summer of a qualifier day yep so like that would be that i'm gonna have two you know four chances to do it i know last year we even drove up to detroit as a team uh and supported those guys with their qualifier so they'll be running two qualifiers up there as well they'll be running four up there yeah and yeah cincinnati columbus uh and pennsylvania 
I mean, Pennsylvania, too. Schnur comes out all the time. Uh, Ron Schnur from, from Pittsburgh. We might as well return the favor one of these days, I think. Yeah, and drive out. <laughs> and drive out there. But I know he comes out to us because we hold a lot more frequent official races. Yeah. Um, and that's something that he wants to get into. So, I mean, but see, that shows it, like, that's worth the drive. He yep. makes the drive. I mean, it's not too far because, I mean, we're more on the Pennsylvania side, and I know he's not too far from the border. So he's not. It's not like he's driving four or five hours, but I think he is putting in at least almost two. Yeah, uh, when two, he comes two out. and a half, something like that. Yeah, comes out to race with us. But he just want. He loves the camaraderie. He loves the adrenaline, um, and wants to pull down that top prize. That motivation factor that keeps you going. Yeah, but dude. <laughs> hopefully, we covered uh, everything. Uh, I mean, we could probably end up talking for another. I two was hours. just about to say that we could talk two hours, man, and it's hard to fit all this good information and our experiences in to an hour episode especially when it comes to racing anything racing and we definitely want to point even if uh you're not a professional yet you're a beginner we want to try to point you in the right direction so which way you know what to expect what to do when you go to these races and i hope we accomplish that in this episode if and not if you we're, know. Gonna re- we're probably going to end up revisiting this topic down the road as things change um and we as we go through this season because we didn't even touch on like spec class racing um, multi gp has always uh, kind of had a thing for that it seems like this year it's dropped off but they're revitalizing it for 2020 to make it a huge accessible spec class so that's where like you have to everybody shows up with the same drone um so it's not like the parts you're flying or the frame you're flying that's giving you an advantage it it boils it down to pilot skill yeah do you i think that's gonna have to be another episode because we we can break that down into like an hour discussion of is these parts the correct parts for spec racing we didn't even touch on race formats so i mean we we briefly touched on it but sometimes you're gonna go by overall lap count sometimes you're going to qualify and then go into bracket racing. And then sometimes it's single elimination. Sometimes it's double elimination brackets. Sometimes it's round robins. Sometimes- Hold these good thoughts, dude. <laughs> Quit giving them out on this episode. People aren't going to come back for the next one, bro. <laughs> but hey, guys, if you got anything you wanted to add to this, hit us up on Instagram. That's the one we got rolling right now. We're going to be getting Facebook up and going uh, sometime in the near future. Go to YouTube, give us a like, a subscribe, and check us out on SoundCloud. We got a couple episodes up there already. And uh, until next time, man. Does anybody else in this world feel like me? Feel like me? Feel, feel like me? Feel, feel like me?